Hello everyone, I'm David Law, Superintendent of Minnetonka Public Schools. And I'm Dan Olson, Minnetonka School Board Treasurer. We're glad you're able to join us for our School Board Recognitions Program. It's so important to take the time to acknowledge and celebrate the outstanding accomplishments of our students, staff, and community members. We begin most of our regular board meetings with recognitions to highlight the positive impact that so many different people make in our district. Tonight, we're recognizing Girls Hockey State third place finishers, Girls Gymnastics State Qualifiers, Boys Swim and Dive State Runners Up, Wrestling State Qualifiers, Fencing State Qualifiers, Middle School Orchestra All State Qualifiers, Middle School Math Counts State and National Qualifiers, High School Math Team State Qualifiers, Science Olympiad State Qualifiers, Elementary, Middle and High School Chess State Qualifiers, and Learn Network Awards for the Minnetonka Community Education Team. We will begin with our winter athletics recognitions. Girls hockey qualified for the state tournament this year where they finished third overall. The team is coached by Tracy Cassano, who also earned an award this season. She has been recognized as the 2024 Section 2A Coach of the Year. The team's assistant coaches are Christine Lee Beloy, Mike Cassano, Troy Iverson, and Selena Ray. Before we recognize each player by name, let's hear more about the team's season. Hi, my name is Tracy Cassano, head girls hockey coach. Our team had another successful season this year. A couple of the highlights of our season included, we were the section 2AA champions, earning our sixth straight state tournament appearance. We finished third place overall in the state. We had two state all tournament team players. We had two all state players. We had three all state honorable mention players. We had a all Metro first team player. We had two top 10 Ms. Hockey finalists and one top five Ms. Hockey finalists overall. We had seven all conference selections and we had three team members who represented not only our community but our country at the U18 Team USA World Championships winning a gold medal. Girls, so proud of all your accomplishments and our continued success. Congratulations to the following girls hockey team members. Lindsay Abar, Sydney Boss Crone, Claire Christofferson, Kendra Dystad, Annika Eggert, Isabella Finnegan, Lauren Goldsworthy, Ashlyn Hazlett, Layla Hemp, Drew Hendrickson, Kennedy Keepman. Grace Larson, Senya Leeper, Lauren Mack, Gemma McAlexander, Delaney Miller, Ruby Rock, Lily Rogers, Allison Ryan, Molly Ryan, Allison Shoba, and Ellie Zakrajek. Minnetonka gymnastics athletes put together a great showing at the state tournament in late February. In the all-around division, senior Emma Callahan finished seventh overall and senior Ellie Betcher was 19th. This was the third state appearance for Callahan and second for Betcher. The team is coached by Christine Myers. Let's hear more about the year. Hi, my name is Christine Myers. I'd like to congratulate the Minnetonka gymnastics team. I'm the head coach there. We had two young ladies who moved on to the Minnesota State High School League tournament this year, Emma Callahan and Ellie Betcher. Both gymnasts had a fantastic season. They were both named to all conference, all section, and all state. They both went on to have great performances. Congratulations to Minnetonka High School Gymnastics, to Ellie and to Emma. Thank you. Congratulations to our Minnetonka gymnasts for the great season. The Minnetonka boys swim and dive team had an incredible state performance. In the team's eighth straight state appearance, the Skippers earned second place as a team. Skippers also captured three individual state titles. The 200-yard individual medley and 100-yard freestyle for Evan Witte, and the 400-yard freestyle relay title for Witte, Bennett Molitor-Kirsch, Bricks DeWitt, and Ben Jabs. The team is coached by John Bradley, Dennis Dadashev, Sarah Bielski, and Sam Freitas. Let's hear more about the team season. Hello, my name is John Bradley, and I am the head coach of the Minnetonka High School Boys Swim Dive Team. Uh, first off, many thanks to our staff this year. 
they were amazing and did a great job coaching. Our assistant coaches, Dennis Dadashev, Sarah Belsky, and Anna Gard, and our head diving coach, Sam Friedis, were all amazing. And many thanks to all of our parents and fans this year. We had a stellar season. Our season started off in December. We won pretty much everything that we swam this year. We won our all of our conference meets. We were the conference champions. We had 15 all-conference swimmers. We were the sectional champions for true team. We were the true team state champions again this year. We were the high school section champions for the MSHSL high school meet. And we ended up second overall at the high school state meet, finishing six points behind Edina. It was an amazing season with amazing leadership from our captains. And I'm so thankful to have been a part of it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Isaac Young and I'm a sophomore. The coaches and team captains have been the most impactful elements of my swimming journey. Their guidance, support and mentorship have shaped not only my swimming skills, but also my character and approach to teamwork. I take great pride in the sense of brotherhood that our team has cultivated through our collective efforts and hard work and enjoyable moments. Congratulations to the following student athletes. Reese Carlson, Young Hai Choi, Soon Hong Chua, Brixton DeWitt, William Finucane Tuchio, Benjamin Jabs, William Jabs, Carter Lewin, Mitchell Lesage, Max Louie, Trey Maroney, Bennett Molitor Kirsch, Lucas Murdick, Jack Petrin, Elias Petrin, Nicholas Quintana, William Rolfe, Daniel Shellstad, Evan Witte, and Isaac Young. Skipper's history was made during this wrestling season. Senior Phoebe Kuhnerth won sections, making her the first ever state qualifier from Minnetonka in girls wrestling. She finished as the state runner-up in her division. Senior Marco Christensen also qualified for state this year, which marks his fourth state appearance. Unfortunately, he was injured in a match and was unable to continue through the tournament. Last year, he was an individual state champion when he won his division. The team is coached by Josh Fry and Joel Schrimpf. Let's hear more about the year. Hey Minnetonka families, Coach Shrimp here. Well, we just got back to the state tournament a few weeks back. We had two wrestlers participate. Uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is Phoebe Kerneth. She was actually our first ever female to enter the state tournament. Now we've had female wrestling represented well at the state tournament of, for a few years, and Minnetonka was able to send the first. It was really quite an experience being that Phoebe going into the tournament uh, came in as a sixth seed, and even taking a step before that, she was the only the fourth seed at section. So it was just one of those cases that she just kept on defying the odds and and winning in an upset fashion. It was so tremendous to watch her in the section tournament go on, uh, beat the number one seed, beat the number two seed, be the section champ, then go on in the state tournament, and make it all the way to the finals. Had a huge win first round against the number three seed. And then an awesome win against number two seed, made to the state finals, wrestled extremely hard in the state finals against a very, very good opponent. And what a phenomenal season uh, for Phoebe to be able to come out with a state runner-up finish, um, represent a Minnetonka in the last matches of the year in front of the big stage. Uh, the second wrestler we had was Marco Christensen. Marco coming off of a state championship from last year. I had a tremendous season. You know, it was... A tough one for Marco. He had a really good first round win. Then he went on and uh, uh, cut his knee really in a bad spot after he took his opponent down to his back. And, uh, you know, it, it just got too bad, was unable to finish. So, you know, but he's got big plans ahead of him. He's going to plan on going to, uh, go, going to Nebraska to wrestle. And uh, right there's a commit, <laughs> signed commit that he has. So he's got a lot of wrestling ahead of him. And certainly, Marco, he's done such a phenomenal job with our, our team. He is second to none on the impact he's had working with the youth, working with the middle school, leading, bringing more wrestlers out. Uh, I'm super, super proud of him, the way he conducted himself at the state tournament afterwards. Just very, very proud of him. And like I said, his impact in this, this uh, wrestling program from start to finish is beyond anyone else has ever done anything. So... Thanks again for the time. I hope uh, another great season. Uh, look forward to seasons ahead. Congratulations again to our wrestlers for their outstanding season. Fencing is offered as an extracurricular activity in our district through Minnetonka Community Education. This year, many students qualified for state, and Minnetonka students took home both state and individual titles. Senior Ciara Grad was the state champion for women's saber. 
As a team, Minnetonka took first place in the women's overall division and second place in the women's epee division. The team is led by head coach Maria Benford and assistant coaches Kaylin Benford, Tim O'Brien, and Jeremy Lockwood. Let's hear more about the team season. Hi, my name is Kaylin Benford, and this is the head coach of the Minnetonka High School fencing team, Maria Benford. And we want to give a huge shout out and congratulations to all of our fencers that competed for the 23 to 2024 fencing year. We want to give a special shout out to our women's EPE team for placing second overall in state. Also, we want to give a shout out to our state champion, state title champion, Sierra Grad for, women, for winning first place for Women's Sabre first overall. And last but not least, we want to give a shout out to all of our fencing girls for winning first overall and women's overall points for Minnetonka High School fencing overall. So again, we want to give a huge shout out and a huge congratulations to all of our fencers that competed this year. Congratulations to the following state qualifying fencers. Aaron Burroughs, Bronson Kalateud, Colin Cho, Lewis Christopher, Cole Click, Luca Cuneo, Chase Draws, Asher Eichmeyer, Benjamin Gensmer, Henry Good, Lucas Grovender, Travel Hayden, Elijah Hempel, Elliot Hill, Braddock Hokinson, Chase Joby, Colin Johnson, Dakota Lockhart, Asher Melsness, Dylan Ross. Asher Ruby, James Savage, David Sawyer, Connor Smith, Zachary Stelpflug, Raymond Taha, Emilio Torano, Maxwell Toten, Dylan Underwood, Everett Verbout, Ryoga Wakai, Lucas Wolf, Eleanor Allerding, Maria Bondar, Emerald Caven, Elise Cornelius, Audrey Gett, Sierra Grad, Josetta Greenley, Joe Hoffman, Sophia Kronzer, Allison Lay. Daria Maxwell, Chloe Morrissey, Caitlin Mully, Melissa Nelson, Carmen Papp, Sophia Shirsova, Athena Timchuk, Signe Van Wick, Melon Wong, and Samantha Yanantelli. Nine Minnetonka Orchestra students have been selected to take part in the Minnesota Middle Level Honors Orchestra, a special opportunity for our musicians to play with others from across the state. Before we recognize each student by name, let's hear about the experience from a teacher and some of our students. Congratulations to the nine Minnetonka Orchestra students that auditioned and were accepted to be a part of the Middle Level Honors Orchestra through the Minnesota String Teachers Association. This is a highly competitive group and is quite an honor. Um, they audition and once they are accepted, they come together in February and perform at the Minnesota Music Educators Association Convention. It's a great honor and your teachers are very proud of you. Congratulations, students. Hello, my name is Denmark and I am in seventh grade. After participating in the double all state, I realized that my fellow players were all very good. This inspired me to make a new goal. Now I see more improvement that can be made of myself. I was a big fish in a small pond. Now I'm a small fish in a bigger pond. I'll look for an even bigger pond once I grow more. Thank you. My name is Marcus Hahn and I'm in eighth grade. In February, I had the opportunity to play bass in the All-State Middle Levels Honors Orchestra. This was a really great experience and I enjoyed preparing music with students from other schools across the state and performing with them in Minneapolis. Orchestra has been an important part of my time in middle school and I'd like to thank all the teachers and students of MMW's music program who made this experience possible for me. Congratulations to the following Middle Level All-State Orchestra members. Anna Golikova, Marcus Hahn, Denmark Kroc, Jacob Lee, William Martin, Alyssa Wren, Dia Sujlar, Evan Truong, and Fisher Walling. We'd also like to recognize our middle school orchestra teachers, Daniel Erickson and Michael Janning. Great work. 
Middle school students from MME and MMW qualified for the state math counts competition this year. At state, MME placed first in the team competition and MMW placed third. Individually, MMW student Andreas Waleksen earned first place and MME student Siyuan Wu placed third. Both will go on to compete at the National Math Counts event later this spring. The MMW team is coached by teacher Morgan Cronin. The MME team is coached by team parents Sandra Lee, Yan Pan, Lee Min Shi, and Walter Truong. Let's hear more about the competition. Huge congratulations to the mathletes who represented MMW at the State Math Counts competition um, a few weeks ago. I'm super proud of all of the hard work collectively as a group. Those four boys practiced over 10,000 problems um, and spent um, over 18 hours just practicing math outside of their normal math class. Um, and their hard work really paid off. Super proud of their hard work. Um, super proud of how far they've come this season and super, super proud of how they all placed. My name is Zachary and I'm in seventh grade. The best part about Math Counts is not just winning. A strong foundation in math skills gives you more opportunities in STEM careers, and going to Math Counts allows you to meet people with similar interests as you. I'm proud of our team for studying and solving problems together and building a team dynamic which helped us succeed. My name is Roger and I am in sixth grade. I'm a Math Count State qualifier and our team got third place at state. I am most proud about getting third place as a team because it was a really hard thing to do. We worked hard and I think we deserved it. After the event, I was motivated to learn more math because I wanted to get a better score next year. Not only that, seeing all the other people who are good at math and how much fun we had really helped fuel my motivation. Hi, my name is Vedant. I'm in seventh grade and I go to Manitonka Middle School West. I'm proud to be a Math Count State qualifier, and I'm happy to be on the team that got third place. I would like to thank Miss Cronin for helping me grow as a mathematician and preparing all of us well for the competition. Thank you. Congratulations to the following Math Counts team members. Vedant Chaitan, Andreas Waleksen, Zachary Wong, Roger Yang, Yan Ru Kao, Alex Ren, Addison Shi, Nicholas Trujillo, Evan Truong, and Siyuan Wu. The MHS math team had a strong season this year. Students qualified for the state tournament where they placed fifth overall. Two Minnetonka students, Michael Luo and Max Kenny, made it all the way to the Math Bowl finals at the state tournament, which recognizes the top 10 individuals at state. Michael placed first, winning the individual Math Bowl title. The math team was coached by Connor Gomer. Let's learn more about the season from the team. Hi, I'm Connor Gomer. I'm the math team coach here at Minnetonka High School. Um, I just wanted to wish a, a quick congratulations um, to the math team for an excellent year. I did want to bring up a few highlights that are worth mentioning. Um, first, our team finished third place in our division, which qualified us for the state tournament. We ended up getting fifth place, fifth place to finish at the state tournament. Um, we also had eight individuals um, qualify for the, the individual state tournament to get to the math bowl. And then out of those eight, two, two of our members, Max and, and Michael, qualified for the individual state tournament math bowl, um, which Michael ended up winning. Um, so a lot to celebrate this year from the math team. I think the thing I appreciate most about this team um, is while we do all take things seriously, work hard, practice at practice, perform during meets and events, um, at the same time it seems like the whole year we had a, a sense of levity. Everybody kind of brought their own personality and humor um, for, the, for the full season. Um, so it was a great year. Um, I'm looking forward to building off uh, this year for years to come um, for math team. Congratulations to the following math team state qualifiers. Yanru Kao, Maximilian Kenny, Jacob Lee, Michael Luo, Alex Ren, Maximus Ren, Addison Shi, Gautam Venkatesh, Siyuan Wu, and Aizada Yurnar. Science Olympiad is one of the premier science competitions in the nation. Competitions run like a track and field meet, featuring many events focused on different scientific disciplines. This year's team placed fifth overall. The students earned many individual medals as well. The team's advisors are Joe Cassette, Timothy Kokesh, and Allison Peterson. Let's hear more from them about the season. Congratulations, Minnetonka Science Olympiad, on another great year. Fifth place overall at state in the 2024 competition. 
And in addition to the team ranking, we also had several groups that performed in the top four teams uh, for their particular event. And we'd like to acknowledge uh, those specific students that did. Uh, in first place for anatomy and physiology, Grayson Lee and Allison Lay. And in first place for Fermi questions, Jason Hung and Michael Liu. In third place for Towers, Christenda, Christenza Nielsen and Carmen Papp. And in fourth place for Fossils, Joe Spuffington and Isabella Toten. In fourth place for the experimental design competition, Owen Wary, Erica Daniels, and Jason Hong. And in fourth place for the micro mission event, Madison Ambrose and Grayson Lee. Thanks guys for a really amazing season and we look forward to next year. Congratulations to the following Science Olympiad team members. Madison Ambrose, Joe's Buffington, Erica Daniels, Lucy Gill, Jason Wong, Stella Kelleher, Kiera Clem, Savannah Larson. Grayson Lee, Allison Lay, Michael Luo, Christenza Nielsen, Carmen Papp, Isabella Toten, and Owen Wary. Last month, Minnetonka students competed and excelled at the state level chess tournament. At the elementary level, the team from Scenic Heights Elementary placed first, and the team from Excelsior Elementary placed third. At the middle school level, the team from MMW placed first. Two students also placed in the top 10 individually. Oregal Renchen was fourth, and Alden Goh was sixth. At the high school level, the team from MHS placed fifth. Individually, Demir Augustine placed second overall. Because of their placement at state, Demir, Oregal, and Alden all have the opportunity to earn spots in national level competitions. Let's hear more from our state chess qualifiers. Hi, my name's Harrison Tan, and I'm in fourth grade. I went to the state chess tournament, and the best part of it was winning it with my friends. Hi, my name is Angela and I'm in fifth grade. It's incredible how our hard work has paid off. It took teamwork and collaboration and determination. I'm proud of what our team accomplished and it is a great honor and achievement. Hi, my name is Albert Yang. I'm a third grader in Ms. Jeldon's Navigator class. I play chess since I was six years old and I love playing chess. I am very happy that we were able to win the state championship. I'm Lewis Collier and I'm in fourth grade. I really like how enthusiastic our team was during the tournament and I'm really optimistic of our team's future. Hi, my name is Su Xing Bi and I'm a third grader. I enjoy playing chess and I'm happy that we won the state tournament in the K-5 section. Hi, my name is Maxwell Smigel. I am in third grade. I started playing chess in kindergarten. I enjoy playing in the state chess championship on the Scenic Heights team. Hello, my name is Stefan Zhe in the fourth grade of Excelsior Elementary. And what I liked about this particular activity was like you can hang around with your friends, play and play chess. And like you can, you can like gain skill sets from this tournament. You can practice notating reviewing your games, and then just in general teamwork. I was proud of like the rank that we achieved based off the amount of team members we had. I'm Artie Cunnan and I'm in seventh grade. I'm Aditi Cunnan and I'm also in seventh grade. We have been learning chess from a private coach named William Murphy. We have been participating in chess tournaments in and around Minnesota. Alden Go, Oracle Renchen, Asher Jibanathan, my sister, and myself have recently participated in the statewide tournament of Minnesota. We are very proud and happy to say that we have kept up our two-year streak in winning the MN statewide chess tournament in first place this year, with over 90-plus participants in our section. Thank you, and we hope to do this more in the future. Thank you. Hello, my name is Alden. I'm an 8th grader from MMW. I, we won the team award for the state scholastic chess tournament. It was really fun playing with my friends and stuff. We, we played a lot of chess tournaments and we also got to meet new people. Congratulations to the following chess state qualifiers. From Scenic Heights, Fu Cheng Bi, Louis Collier, Angela Lee, Maxwell Smigel, Harrison Tan, 
and Albert Yang. From Excelsior, Alexander Bajorek, Declan Bajorek, Ames Jivanathan, Eric Kemp, and Stefan Jing. From MMW, Alden Go, Asher Jivanathan, Artie Kanan, Aditi Kanan, Oregal Renchen. And from MHS, Demir Augustine, Lucas Granucci, Michael Sander, and William Jong. Our final recognition of the evening is for our community education program. Last year, Minnetonka Community Ed was named as a top 10 community education program in the nation by the LEARN Network, and they earned that honor again in 2024. In addition to the program honor, two MCE administrators were named among the LEARN Network's top community education practitioners for 2024. Congratulations to Tim Litvin, Executive Director of Community Education, and Jenny Badurka, Assistant Director of Community Education. Thank you to both of you for your leadership, which has made Minnetonka Community Education one of the best programs in the nation. Now, Tim Litfin will share more about the recognitions our community education program has received. Hello, school board members. I've got some great news to share with you today from Minnetonka Community Education. As you know, Minnetonka Community Ed was recently named a top 10 community ed program in America in 2023. Well, the list came out in January for 2024. And once again, Minnetonka Community Education in back-to-back -back years was named one of the top 10 community ed programs in America. That's pretty cool news. And I'm happy to share that with you. But the news gets better yet. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, the LEARN organization came out with their top 50 practitioner list in community education in America. And here in Minnetonka Community Ed, I'm very happy to report that we had two of them. Jenny Badurka, assistant director, was named one of the top 50 practitioners in America, and they needed just one more to round out the field, so they selected me. So that's pretty cool news from the LEARN organization and right here in Minnetonka Community Education. Have a great rest of the meeting tonight. Thank you for your uh, work with Minnetonka Community Ed. That concludes our recognition program for this evening. Thank you again for celebrating with us. The April school board meeting will begin shortly.
Welcome. I'd like to call to order the April 11th, 2024 school board meeting of Minnetonka Schools. If we can all rise and say the pledge. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, can I have a motion to adopt tonight's agenda? So uh, Patrick, is there a second? second. Chris, uh, any uh, additions or deletions, changes to the agenda? All right, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, we have an agenda. Uh, first item tonight is school reports from both Community Education and Excelsior. Superintendent Law. Madam Chair, members of the board, as you're aware, we start every meeting, every uh, public school board meeting with presentations from schools or in tonight's case, community education. This is an opportunity that for those sites to share what's happening in their facilities this year and to link some of the board goals together about how they're putting board goals into place. We'll kick off with community education and Assistant Director Jenny Baderka. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board, Super Superintendent Law. Thanks for the opportunity to be here this evening to share a little bit about what has happened in community ed over the last year. We've got a lot of great things going on for our community members of all ages to find a place to learn, grow, uh, connect, and belong. So we'll start off with a video um, with some highlights. We are excited to share what has been happening at Minnetonka Community Education tonight. Minnetonka Community Ed is a place for everyone, birth through adult, to find belonging, community, and to develop their unique passions. As we celebrate being named a top 10 community education program by the International Learn Organization for the second year in a row in 2024, we thought we'd tell you about our top 10 MCE highlights of the year. Number one, events. In 2023-24, MCE hosted many unique and popular events, bringing thousands to the district. From Tour de Tonka to Lego building competitions to bingo to our third annual Tonka Top Chef event and to our first ever and sold out puzzle competition, people of all ages came to MCE for engaging, enjoyable and unique community event experiences. For MCE, volunteers at events go hand in hand. MCE has thousands of amazing volunteers that help make our MCE events a reality. We are thankful for their support. Number two, participation in youth and adult programs continue to exceed past year's registrations. This summer, we are offering over 130 adult class sections and over 650 youth class sections. We are very proud of the variety of offerings we have for our community. Number three, Project SOAR, Adults with Disabilities, continues to offer unique programs with participation, hitting new highs, and programming reaching new audiences in our community and beyond. Number four, we have 54 students involved in our Adult Options Program, learning ESL and exploring career opportunities. Many of these adult students also have their children enrolled in Minnetonka Preschool. How cool is that, that they are learning together in the same building? Number five, Explorers Child Care hosted many family nights and fun service projects, including food drives. Explorers, again, has strong registration numbers for both school year and summer programming with openings still existing in each. Number six, Minnetonka Preschool and ECFE recently held Read the Rainbow. This six-week event promoted literacy and excitement about reading both at school and at home. Teachers and students celebrated each week by reading a book that coordinated with that week's color. Students were each gifted with a book to take home. Number seven, our new makerspace officially opened and has been home to several creative classes for youth and adults, as well as open lab times. Number eight, MCE will celebrate our 20th anniversary of the Tonka Youth Triathlon this year. Check it out on Saturday, May 18th. By popular request, we are adding a new K and first grade division this year. Number nine, the MCE Hall of Fame. 
On Monday, April 15th, MCE will officially add three new members to the MCE Hall of Fame. Congratulations to Boyer Building, to Ron Camps and his family, and also to Dana Teller. Number 10, service projects and programs are also a big part of who we are, including holiday family giving, rakeathon, hosting a blood drive, service days for youth, and so much more. As we enter into spring and look ahead to summer, we are offering many new and exciting programs for this community. You'll hear more about this in our presentation tonight. Thank you for helping make Minnetonka Community Education a strong and thriving program where everyone can find a place to belong. We are excited to show. Oh. oh, there we go, got it, okay. All right, well, those are some highlights, and we have a few more things that we wanted to share with you this evening. So something that you may remember us talking about each year at this meeting is a two-question survey that we conduct with all of our customers every February. It's really quick. How are, do you rate our programs overall and our customer service? So on a scale of 1 to 5, these are our ratings for this year, so we're excited to see them going up to 4.4, um, and just a nice way for us to check in with all of our customers uh, throughout the year. You've also heard about our uh, top 10 awards from LEARN and just wanted to share a little bit more about the criteria for that award, which includes really consistent, strong programming, um, strong leadership, uh, excellent communication and marketing, and impactful service to our community. So we're really proud of that recognition. And something we've been working on a lot this year um, is around making sure that all of our community knows the days when our catalog is opening for registration. Some of our programs are quite popular, so we're, we're always wanting to make sure everyone knows um, those big days. And we have also made some modifications to our catalog production timeline so that our catalogs reach homes before our registration opens. Um, and so as you look over the last several years, you've seen these are our opening day registration numbers. They continue to grow year over year. Um, and we had our biggest summer registration opening this year, uh, 3,682 registrations on that first day. And so we are busy planning for the fall right now. Our catalog registration will open on the 16th of July. So that's been great to see um, more adult customers having that information and being able to register on that first day as well. Another publication that will be arriving in home soon uh, is the image you see there, which is our summer postcard. So it's just a reminder to families that we have summer camps and classes available. Uh, we opened registration in mid-February for summer, which is going very well. Um, but this uh, postcard also has a link to a week-by-week -week planning guide. So if families have planned most of their summer, but they have a few weeks where they have things open, they can kind of... Uh, look into that week by week and find some great options of things for their kids to get involved in. Um, some new programs we have this summer is a family camping. Um, there'll be a couple of classes and then the groups can actually go and camp overnight together at a local campsite. Uh, we have a photography program we'll be starting, some rocket building classes, um, and actually this spring we started a mahjong class uh, and we are going to be continuing that into the summer. Uh, but we sent out some notification to our customers and it filled within just a couple days. So we're excited about that new area to explore. Uh, driver education is a big program for us all year, but also a lot of students take that in the summer. So we have over 800 different classes for students to choose from all ages. This is a few more photos of our maker space that you heard about in our video. We do have a community um, art mural that we're building so folks can come and um, paint and design one of those hexagons and then we're hanging them up on the wall. So anytime you're in the area, feel free to stop by MCC. It's a great new space that we've used for a lot of different programs, both youth and adults. And a long-standing program that we wanted to tell you a little bit more about tonight is our uh, Minnetonka Music Academy. So um, Amber Young is the program manager that oversees that, and she does an amazing job. And we have a huge uh, participation. We have 360 individuals who are taking private music lessons, um, ranging from preschool age to adults. Uh, and we're coming up towards their spring recital time. That'll be middle of May. Uh, we also do have a lot of other performing groups through the Music Academy um, and our middle school Philharmonic Orchestra group 
uh, recently had a regional competition where they got a superior rating, so they will have the opportunity to perform at Orchestra Hall on the 15th of April. They've also been able to do a lot of community outreach uh, this year, going to several senior living centers to play music for the residents there. So a great program we wanted to highlight. Um, new this year, we've been continuing to try to grow our focus on family category of programs, so different offerings for families. Uh, and we did a puzzle competition. Uh, you'll see a few photos of, of it up there. Everyone had the same puzzle, and it was a timed um, competition who could finish first. So a lot of great fun was had there. And then we've hosted two different bingo nights, one in the fall and one in the spring. Um, lots of prizes and lots of fun uh, had by all. Non-school days are a very um, busy time for us. We offer explorers childcare on non-school days, uh, as well as a lot of different camps, uh, classes for students to participate in, uh, from service learning, to um, taking day trips for ski club, to working with the high school dance or cheer teams to have clinics for uh, students. So on the 26th of January, we had about 850 students between explorers and our classes um, participating in some type of community ed programming. So that was a, a big highlight for us, but we always enjoy the opportunity to develop new and fun things for students to enjoy on non-school days. To talk a little bit about Explorers, our child care program, uh, we have registration open now for summer. Uh, we have about 918 uh, people registered for summer coming various number of days. Um, there's, they need to come 15 days throughout the summer for our K through five program. Um, so lots of activity there. We do lots of fun field trips and go to the beach and have an ice cream truck that comes to the school once a week. So we're busy planning for a fun summer. Uh, and in mid-March, we also opened registration for our 24-25 um, school year um, before and after school care. So um, that is still open for folks to register. Um, but so far for next year, we have just over 1,200 students registered between our junior explorers preschool age program and our K through five before and after school. And of course, we are always looking for great people to join our team. So um, those who are looking for year long roles, we have positions open for that. We also have a lot of summer opportunities available. So anyone who knows high school, college students um, looking for summer jobs or um, those who don't typically work in the summer looking to add something into their summer schedule, we are um, looking for folks to join our team. So you can visit the district website for our positions that are available, and we hope you'll join us. And I'm going to turn it over to Molly now to talk a little bit about preschool. Thank you. Madam Chair, members of the board, Superintendent Law. Um, Minnetonka Preschool is doing amazing right now. We've been having just a blast with um, examining early literacy this year. You'll see from our Read the Rainbow initiative that we have really um, tried to live the idea that kids have to love the idea of reading before they can learn to read. And so we've just been spending a lot of time engrossed in fun stories and doing different things that get them interested and engaged with reading. Our summer junior explorers theme this year will be Once Upon a Time. And so we'll be just taking that wherever the kids want to go and it's going to be great. Our first day of registration for preschool opened at 254, which was the highest we've had our uh, last year was 241, and that was our highest by at least 50 from the year before. So we're really seeing a lot of um, community buzz about being a part of our program, and so that means they think they have to register right away on the first day, which is awesome, but we still have space available. We have the capacity to serve um, at least 380 students. I could go higher, but that's what we have offered at the moment. Um, we are at 288 today, so there is still lots of space available. Um, we have added different sections to try to meet different needs for different families, and so there is a little bit of something for everyone still. So if anyone is interested, or if you know anyone who thinks, oh, I missed the first day, I can't get in, that is not true. Um, one thing I wanted to highlight is some partnerships and some ways that we are trying to increase our early childhood and family education, or ECFE, outreach. So um, ECFE receives a levy from the state, and we also take tuition for our programming. It's on a sliding fee scale, and so um, people can decide what they'd like to pay for their tuition. But that means that we have a pool of money that we can use to try to get 
to people who can't get to us. So um, two initiatives that we have this year is one is called Free Fridays. Um, so there's three Fridays in a month typically that we can program on and we have a Science Friday, um, Friday Friends, which is just kind of like a meet up, meet other people, meet um, people who have kids your same age. And then Once Upon a Time is our story hour that we offer through Help Us Grow. Um, and then we have two positions in our program that are help um, that are funded through the um, Minnetonka Family Collaborative that go out into the community, also serving our preschools. So we have a child and family behavior support specialist who um, can go to any daycare within school bounds and help if there's a kiddo who's showing some behavior um, needs or if a family is expressing that they have some desire for some help. And then we have a family resource facilitator who goes out and meets all of the resources that are part of our collaborative and then are part of our community. And through that, we were able to build a new partnership with Excelsior United Methodist. They um, have opened an ICA food shelf at their church and they're working on building a park on that side of Highway 7 because uh, there isn't one nearby. So they're working with the city. And so we have come in and been attending the food shelf nights so that we can meet the families. And then there are some volunteers there who are willing to translate for us. So we're able to get access to people that we just don't have as easy of access to from our building. Um, I'm really excited to see where that goes. It's so far been really great. And then we also go to Stratford Wood. Um, we had been there for a long time and then we weren't there and then we were back again. So we just keep asking people if we can come in and we always say yes when they invite us. We have also had some really great partnerships with the library this year um, during our Read the Rainbow Week. The um, person who works at our local library came in and helped to give out library cards to the students and the families. Our PTO puts on one of the best spring events in town and anyone can come. So if you have a little kid, please come. Um, and by little, even high schoolers come and enjoy the time that we have because we've got food trucks and um, face painting and cakewalk and there's fire trucks. This year we're gonna have construction vehicles. I mean, the kids are gonna lose their mind when they see this stuff. So. It's an awesome um, group of humans. I have 21 people on my PTO and they are all just so engaged with trying to raise money to give back to families that need something and to the teachers in our building. So it is an honor to be there and I usually just kind of stand in awe with the cool things that they've got going on and how organized they are. I definitely want to hire them all. Um, we talked about our Hall of Fame, which is going to be on Monday. Uh, Boyer Building is our business partner. We're, um, po I can never say this word, post posthumously, thank you, um, honoring Ron Camps, who was a big MCE volunteer along with a volunteer in the community. And then Dana Teller, who was our child and family behavior support specialist for 25 years. I see Chris knows exactly who I'm talking about. Um, Dana Teller-isms are still prevalent throughout our building. Uh, one of the main one that is always said is slower, lower, less. So when your child is up here, you go slower, lower, less. So it's, I'm so excited that she's being honored with this. And then I just wanted to highlight all of our um, events for the summer. We're coming up on the big season where we're just doing, it's such a fun time because people are just jazzed to be out. And so they're happy to be a part of the community. It's fun to see people signing up together. So we have our trail trot on May 2nd. We have the youth triathlon on the May 18th and that is the 20th anniversary. And that's one of my favorite. I work the bike corral for that one and I've um, brought my eight year old in and he gets his foam fingers out and helps direct all the bikes. So if you have that morning free, we could definitely use your help. The mud run is on the 13th of July, and that is also on such a cool event because where it is is so beautiful. And then Tour de Tonka is the first Saturday in August, August 3rd. I think all of you have been there and seen. Um, no rain this year. And then Fall de Tonka is in September, and that is also just you know, with the weather, it's been very hot. So we have bought long sleeve shirts in the past, and I think we were maybe going to try going short sleeve this year just because it's been so warm. So we always need help to make these things happen, and the volunteer shifts do not have to be your whole day. A lot of these events are just in the morning. Um, we'll take you for an hour. Uh, whatever you're willing to give, we will take. So please be sure that you check out our website, and if you have a desire to 
see what's happening but don't want to participate in them, volunteering is what you need to do. Uh, thank you very much for your time tonight. If you need to get a hold of us or have any questions, that's our contact information. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Any questions or comments? I have one question. Hey, thank Lauren. you for the info. Yeah. Do you need volunteers for the spring fair? Um, also, or are you set for that? You know, I think they would always take volunteers, okay. right? Like, yeah. we, they're, like I said, there's a lot of them, and they really have it down to, I mean, Chris can attest, they have it down to Pat, but <laughs> if you come, we will put you to work, right? Like, the, <laughs> the face painting line will be too long, and we'll be like, it's fine, just do a heart, but help get this line down. So, yes, please, we will take you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? It's just always really exciting to hear about all that's going on in that building. So thank Thanks. you for your yeah. work. And thank you all for your support. Thank you. Um, next up, we have a report from Excelsior Elementary. Superintendent Law. I'll just introduce first year principal, Jen Spazel, and let her tell about Excelsior. Welcome, Jen. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Superintendent Law, community. Um, we are super excited to be here tonight. My name is Jennifer Smazel, principal at Excelsior, and I have Brooke Eigel with me, a fourth grade teacher from Excelsior. And we're here to talk to you about our progress toward the board goals. Um, and we're highlighting our um, belonging and excellence at our school. So this planning really started out this summer during one of our administrative planning days. And we set the conditions for success with MTSS really being our umbrella, multi-tiered systems of support. And based on board goals and building goals, the focus would be on climate, culture, connection, and communication. We began by finding ways to build a connected school community. Some of you can recognize that image. Another way um, to deepen the school community was really to utilize the feedback from all the staff that was taken over the summer to ensure all, and one of their goals was to ensure that all students knew every staff member in our school. So we worked really hard the first couple of weeks putting their pictures out there, practicing their names. We wanted every student really to know that staff member to grow their circle of adults, um, trusted adults, and have additional people to go to for support. We did this with all staff in our building. We also had several visitors come to our school. We partnered with the high school, the beauty of being at the high school for three years, um, developed some partnerships there. We had several visitors come from the high school, the middle school, and community um, to read books to our students during Black History Month and I Love to Read Month. We wanted the students to really see themselves as student leaders and through the books. We also had this large celebration, our Chinese New Year celebration. Um, part of being a Chinese immersion school is studying the culture and Chinese New Year. Connection and engagement really, we believed, contribute to a sense of belonging. The Chinese New Year event was very well attended, and students were so excited and so proud of the event for two days straight. Kids would come up to me and say, Ms. Mazel, did you see me there? <laughs> um, and I did. So that was a really fun event to celebrate our school as well. Um, and I'm going to just highlight, we had a collaborative art project this year where we brought together over 800 students, staff, and Excelsior families to create this piece of art that represents us as a community. This included all of our nutrition staff, our custodial staff, parents, and more, every single person had a piece of this puzzle. Who needs a square? Mosaic is an art glued to a substrate with lots of tessera and tesserae. It's basically a picture with a lot of different pieces. This is part one of our school beautification project that's going to be a 40 square foot mosaic mural. Since our school is Chinese and English, we have stuff from China and a bunch of Chinese places and stuff from here in Minnesota. Each class comes in, they do a little part, the next group comes in and picks up where they left off. I tell the kids that we're making a gift for the future. There are some pandas incorporated that are pretty cute. They're actually like 3D. It's the lake, the, it's Lake Minnetonka. I'm assuming most people in this world don't really know how to do mosaics. It, it's hard work, but it's really worth it. It's just amazing to see what kids can come up with in their brains. It feels 
sounds like you're really accomplishing something when you when you see the finished product. You can say that like I worked on that. I did this piece there. Who needs a square? Jose. So I do have to say that kids, it's it's a great view from my office to the uh, mural and daily we have kids walking up and pointing to each other, showing each other their piece of, of the mosaic. Um, in addition to the celebration and ways to connect as a community, there was intentionality around supporting um, all of our students socially and emotionally. We worked really hard to use our social thinking frameworks, our morning meetings, we have an executive function coach at our school, we were doing check-ins, and in addition to that, we had one-on-one -on -one support for students that were high risk on our uh, Sabre screener that we sent out. And um, we, with these supports and intervention, we, you, as you can see, for 2024, we made some progress and we continue um, to work to support those students. Uh, we, we do the Sabres three times a year to check in on the kids. This support is so important that students, that they can, I'm sorry, this support is so important so that students can feel celebrated, safe, and connected so they can learn at high levels. And now Brooke's gonna talk a little bit about our reboot of our positive behavior systems plan. Madam Chair, members of the board, and Superintendent Law, thank you for having me. I'm Brooke Eisel. I teach fourth grade at Excelsior. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about our positive behavior system that we put into place this school year. Um, we found through Carrie Palmer's social thinking that having common vocabulary was really essential in having successful interactions and um, kids that feel great about school. So in thinking about this positive behavior system, we wanted to make sure that we did have common language and also consistency within our classrooms, our common spaces, and our programs. So the process um, included the building leadership team um, breaking down into a smaller group called the Behavior Expectations Committee. And in that time and that work together, we vetted um, best practices across different districts throughout the state and the country, um, and then had feedback from our teams and even from our students on what felt good and what our school should be as a community. Um, and in that process, we came up with four pillars, um, being respectful, responsible, positive, and safe. And instead of just telling the kids, you need to exemplify that. Um, what does that look like, sound like, and feel like? So we came up with a visual that is posted all around our school um, to create that consistency so kids can be reminded of the, the expectations and, and the kind of bar we want them to reach. Um, in addition to creating this poster, we also decided to have it in Mandarin for our Chinese immersion learners. Um, so you'll see both posted around our building in multiple venues and in multiple sizes. Um, the rollout for this program was Principal Smazel having a school-wide Google Meet so that everybody was on the same page with uh, student-facing slides that we as classroom teachers or specialists can reference if we need a quick reboot. Um, but you can see the four pillars there and um, kind of our goal. So what does that look like when kids follow the plan? Um, they're loving it. We started off with um, these incentive bracelets so that it was kind of a reminder for the kids to kind of keep those pillars in mind. Um, and then we have skipper tickets. So uh, any staff member can give out a ticket for students meeting one of the four or more of the pillars. And the students can earn them individually, they can earn them in small groups, or the whole class can earn it for um, being successful leaders. What happens is they bring the skipper ticket back to the classroom and celebrate. Then they take the skipper ticket home to celebrate with their family and come back as even stronger leaders here at school. Each skipper ticket is connected to a pom-pom, so students are earning 25, 50, or 75 pom-poms with a um, collection of incentives that are per grade level. So for example, for fourth grade for my kids, um, they've had PJ Day, they've had you know Fort flashlight reading, um, lots of different things, but the big highlight is hitting 75 and having an experience with Principal Smazel. So you know, a fun lunch date or a game outside um, is really motivating to them to feel connected to all staff members, um, even those that are so incredibly busy in our building. 
Um, and next, I just wanted to share a cute little video from two of my students, Libby Montgomery and Emmy Burns, on kind of the impact that this has had on them this school year. Hi, I'm Emmy, and this is my best friend, Libby. And we're here to talk to you about Excelsior's new behavior plan. I think it helps us follow the group plan and be a better person with our friends and generally our school family. And I think that it's increased learning skills that we're all doing the same thing following the group plan and it makes me feel safe and like we belong at our school. This is our pom-pom jar that we've earned as a class together. Each person earns a pom-pom or we earn it together. And when you earn a pom-pom or get a skipper ticket, you get to put it inside the jar and you get to count it up and 25, 50, and 75, you each get a reward. And at 75, you get a prize with our amazing principal, Smaza. We've earned so far a pajama party, but we loved it so much that we did it twice. And right now we're still at 50, but we're going hard to get to that 75. In addition to um, Hi, Libby, Emmy, oh, excuse me, Libby and, and Emmy, um, other students had shared, you know, we really love having a goal and being able to work together. Um, it helps us improve our behavior and follow the teacher's plan so that we can be successful. Um, it's really fun to be a team. Um, talked about really enjoying um, adults in the building being proud of them and then being able to take that home and have mom and dad and their families be proud as well and ultimately feeling connected and being able to learn more if everybody is on the same page. So it's been really successful and fun. Um, every morning we start with um, the four pillars, and so if you go in any classroom in our building, you'll see something similar to this. Thanks for having me. Oh, and if you don't have the arm, it doesn't count. <laughs> All right, we are proud to say that students reported having strong levels of positive school climate with instructional practices and sense of belonging increasing significantly from 22 to 23. And I highlighted that with those red arrows. The red line on the second graph represents last year, so we're continuing to make growth. In addition, uh, students overall reporting that they're experiencing that strong developmental relationship overall, which is also um, increasing from last year. Excelsior Elementary is dedicated to reflecting, refining, and implementing research-based literacy instruction that promotes academic success of students at all achievement le levels. Our uh, literacy goal is to increase on the NWEA MAP score from 60% to 62% in the spring. So we've put systems in place, a tiered system in place, um, that um, has very specific and targeted um, and strategic work around um, building that robust core curriculum. We've asked every teacher to create small groups that are fluid within their classroom, so that's one of our goals this year, as well as implementing some research-based um, instruction and best practices, both Tier 1 and Tier 2. Some of those highlights um, are implementing those strategies from our district-wide PD. Um, every classroom created that schedule to include small group instruction, which was not always an easy task. Um, so we had to make sure that, that that structure and framework was in place to be able to lead those small groups. We've worked on a book room um, where we revamped our book room, putting, um, replacing those predictable texts um, with decodable texts. Um, according to, you know, science of reading, that's the best practice, and also high-interest reading materials, so we continue to work on that. We've used building staff meetings to train our teachers um, with new literacy practices like we spoke about that are evidence-based and research-based, um, and we've also put into practice teachers observing best practices in one another's classrooms. This summer, we'll be doing a book study around some of these um, uh, evidence-based interventions. And so here is one of our first grade teachers. Um, she's 
sharing a little bit about this reciprocal teaching method, which is a comprehension strategy to go deeper into comprehension. And we started this uh, strategy beginning in kindergarten. And kids are enjoying it and, and, and making growth. And here's some other class or images of classrooms using the reciprocal teaching, uh, both in fourth and fifth grade, um, to have a deeper understanding of comprehension strategies. When researcher John Hattie ranked 138 teaching strategies according to their impact, reciprocal teaching landed at number nine, roughly yielding two years growth in one year. Um, the goal is optimal growth is about 0.7 or above. That's why we chose that, that intervention to do school-wide. Uh, fluency is a predictor of comprehension, so we use this screening tool, FastBridge, uh, three times per year. And you can see, again, we are making growth. If a student um, isn't making the growth, oftentimes we'll try different interventions, and if what we're doing isn't working, we will put that student through what's called student support team uh, process to get all uh, a, a bunch of different perspectives um, and suggestions on different ways to help that student. Um, and so that would be the next step. We do have more work to do, but it feels like we're on the right track. So our vision um, that we had this year, plus the goal setting, plus collaboration and hard work, uh, went from this to our collective work uh, working hard to put the pieces together to really creating something beautiful like this that we can be proud of. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Any questions or uh, comments? I love that mural. It's really cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is community <clears throat> comments. I don't believe we have any tonight. Is there anybody who wished to speak? Okay. Um, moving on will be uh, adoption of the Minnetonka Foundation's teacher grants. Superintendent Law. Chair Sullivan, Chair members of the board, we are incredibly fortunate to have a supportive partner in the Minnetonka Public Schools Foundation. Uh, tonight, Director Joel House is going to come out and share with us um, the results. I couldn't tell if Ms. Flowers was waving at me or <laughs> giving me a direction. So, uh, we'll let... Uh, Jill Howe, give us an update on teacher grants. It's an amazing opportunity for our teachers to provide some additional things in their classroom, and I heard a little bit about it, and I just want to thank you in advance for the work that you're doing with Definitely. us. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Superintendent Law, school board members, and community. Uh, the Minnetonka Schools Foundation is honored to present for your approval for the recommended uh, what you have in front of you, the award of $109,124 in grants. That's 50 different grants um, to different grant applicants that encompasses every school in our district, as well as Tonka Online. And we consider ourselves so fortunate to be a partner with such an amazing district and help with our outstanding teachers to provide educational opportunities for our students through these grants. Uh, thus far, throughout the foundation's tenure, we have, um, in the past 20, 35 years, we've funded over 970 grants, which has totaled $1.45 million. And Troon's gonna take over and give you a little more statistics about the grants. 
Hi, for those who don't know me, I'm Troon Dowds. I'm the chair of the Teacher Grant Committee with the Foundation. Uh, overall this year, we received 66 requests, totaling just under $210,000. Um, and that would be for the following 24-25 school year. Uh, after careful consideration, uh, the foundation board voted on the 50 that you had some detail on there. Uh, in addition to that, there were two grants that were able to be placed or funded um, through existing district resources just by making those connections in, in our meetings with the, with the district. Um, of special note, the Minnetonka Alumni Association also fundraises for teacher grants. Um, they are able to contribute to eight grants this year, totaling uh, $4,250. Uh, so we are asking for the school board's approval of these grants. Uh, we would then notify all the grants of final decisions in the coming days. On May 13th of this year, we are going to be having a reception. Uh, you will all be receiving invites for that. Um, so uh, that, I'm going to dangle a little carrot here, partially concludes my, our presentation here. Uh, happy to stand for questions on the teacher grants uh, that you have, and then uh, post-vote, I uh, have one other thing to present to you. All right, can I have a motion to approve the uh, Minnetonka Foundation teacher grants as outlined in the board packet? So moved. Chris, is there a second? Second. Mike, uh, any questions or comments for the foundation before we vote? Okay, uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, the foundation teacher grants are approved, and I, you have another little plug for us. <laughs> I do, thank you so much for that. Um, it, uh, as some of you may know, in, in addition to the uh, $80,000 that our endowment fund has provided for uh, the technology needs at the forum at the new Momentum Advantage building this year. Um, based off of seeing three years of teacher request, ask, and need, um, the foundation is going to provide a one-time gift in the amount of $100,000 for decodable readers uh, for the district for this coming school year. That's great. Thank you so much. And as always, thank you to the entire foundation for all you do for raising the funds for the district and getting it into the classroom. It's great for our students, which is the most important part. Any other questions or comments? Thank you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, next item on our budget tonight is approval of the fiscal year 24 amended budget. Superintendent Law. Madam Chair, members of the board, throughout the year as we have different shifts and adjustments to our annual budget, Mr. Bourgeois comes up to Clarify for the public and the board the current status for our budget. Tonight he will be providing an update after our uh, winter, uh, including some negotiations that have been added in as well as some other accounting. Mr. Rizwa. Uh, thank you, Superintendent Law, <coughs> Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, I actually realized a few days ago, it's like I'm probably the last, I am the last person on the the management, administrative, and board team that was around in 2007 when the district kind of changed course and implemented a bunch of strategies that have served us well for since that point in time. And uh, the, the one thing about this uh, presentation is it's related to this year's budget, but it also it impacts next year's budget and coming budgets. And, and this is probably the uh, most important presentation I've had to give to you since 2007 when I talked to the board about uh, bonding for long-term maintenance instead of doing pay-as-you-go so we could do a tax-neutral uh, proposal for the operating referendum. So um, it's, uh, uh, we're, at, we're at a point where uh, there's, uh, it's not an unanticipated one. A lot of you have been on the board for a while, uh, and a lot of you have been in the audience of the board for a while and then on the board. And, but uh, we are at a point that uh, we've been approaching, and uh, well, I guess when you're at, at a point you're approaching, you're there. So um, we'll be going through that. Uh, I, I have to, uh, I always take the opportunity to, to point this out because we've been unique for about 18 years. Fiscal year 24, even with our amended budget, again, was a th uh, the 18th year that we did, did not have to do a cost containment process, which what other districts might call budget reductions. And I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, but we had gone through as a district uh, a, a period of, of budget reductions after the, the state uh, put more, more uh, financial responsibility on the state and, and lowered property tax responsibility. 
and coming off of a, of a basically a 5% budget cut back then in 2006, um, we've been, uh, because of strategy changes, we've been on an 18-year run where we've been able to, to basically not have to go through that. While districts all around the state, if you looked at their budgets during the same time, they'd have that same pattern as we had prior to 96. Theirs just continued on. So we've been, we've been unique in that regard. Uh, we've had our resident enrollment actually has been steadily declining, but open enrollment uh, has benefited the district greatly. And I'm just going to keep saying that because it's, it's a fact. And, and uh, I know that the, the additional traffic at the schools is not fun, but what, what it does for our students is incredible in terms of what we can afford to provide for them. And this is actually a slide showing uh, fiscal year 23, our last year that we closed. And there's a lot of, a lot of numbers on here, but I point out just a couple uh, related to open enrollment. In, in fiscal year 2023, every open enrollment student, student paid for themselves all their incremental costs. And they had $2,627 in the revenue that they each brought left over to use for opportunities for resident students. And that boosted money for regular instruction uh, the money that doesn't have any other obligations on it, um, boosted money for regular instruction for our resident students by 24%, over $10 million. If you think of that, what, what, what do we fund with that? I mean, you look at uh, the extra reading teachers to teach immersion students to read in two languages, um, navigators, vantage, momentum, um, it, our robust elementary band orchestra chorus, those types of things. All those things are possible because of what we've been able to do and what resident enrollment uh, or open enrollment brings to the district. So we've been, this is Tour de Tonka, right? Okay, but we've been like the rider up in front, ahead of the pack for these 18 years. And uh, we've been out there, uh, out in front uh, by ourselves, and we've been able to do that because of the, uh, the revenue strategies and, and operating referendum uh, uh, capacity that we were able to utilize and our voters had, have uh, very generously approved for us. Uh, and of course, we've known that we've been at operating referendum capacity for a while. Uh, FY24 is our eighth year with additional operating referendum from the November 3rd, 2015 election. It was passed by 72%. Uh, we've been utilizing those revenues every year. The important takeaway from this slide is at the bottom in, in parentheses, we've been lobbying the legislature to increase the operating referendum cap since 2018. Uh, we've started talking about it in 2017, saying, hey, in order to continue this, we're, this streak, we're going to have to be uh, getting some help from the legislature, and, but not money. We just want them to give us the chance to ask. So far, we have not had success with getting our legislators to help us in this area. They, they, we've just So right now, we are at the cap, and we have no ability to ask for more. So maybe that will change one day, but right now, that's where we're at in spite of our best efforts. So I used the metaphor, uh, several of you have seen this, you've seen other metaphors that we've been flying high like a 747, and, uh, but this is um, a metaphor of, of approaching, you know, looking and piloting in the distance. We've been, a ship turns slowly, a big ship of state like this turns very slowly. We make decisions and there's trends. Decisions we made in 2017 is, have carried through 17 years, or I'm sorry, 2007, have carried through into, for 17 years, additional years. Um, the, uh, um, you know, but we've been heading up to inflection point. Slowly, we've known it, and we've been trying to manage out over the horizon. But we are coming to, we've, we are coming to inflection point, and uh, we'll have to deal with that uh, in the next six months uh, as, we, as we move forward because uh, the, we have an immovable point of land in front of us, so to speak, and we're going to have to figure out a way to steer around it. So again, just... Uh, in, this is just the, our legislative position statements from uh, adopted by the board on December 7th of 2017. That was the first time we asked to say, hey, could we have some additional uh, act capacity in the operating referendum cap? So we've had seven legislative sessions so far. Maybe the eighth legislative session will get us some, uh, some uh, um, success and, and the, the opportunity to ask. So we have to keep trying. We absolutely have to keep trying. But FY25 and FY26, we have deficits that we're looking at. You saw that in your packet, and I'll be talking about it a little bit more in detail. But uh, they're not a surprise. Again, no help from the legislature. We, are, um, um, we have been projecting FY25 deficits and FY26 deficits for quite some time. So for FY24, our amended budget, 
Uh, we are at $162.4 million uh, of revenues and expenditures of, of $164.7 million. Uh, so we are actually showing a net deficit of about $2.4 million, uh, it, which will still have an unassigned fund balance. It'll decline by that much down to $19.7 million. Uh, the, uh, uh, this is as of uh, everything after we finish with mediation with the, the uh, MTA. So we talked about the uh, amended budget, a draft amended budget on February 22nd prior to the February 23rd mediation. So this is everything everything included now that we know all the factors. So um, we have our Stripe spreadsheet, which is small on the screen to read, so I just summarized the numbers. Our, our FY24, uh, we're showing a deficit of 2.3 million, and then FY25, with everything that's set for our, our uh, revenue formulas, um, our enrollment, assuming another 130 students that you authorized us to go up to, uh, and then the, uh, the MTA settlement, uh, is all in there, uh, and assumptions of, of bargaining with our other units is in here. So we're showing about a $6.3 million uh, deficit for FY25, which starts uh, in uh, about two and a half months. And we are working on adjusting that. Uh, Superintendent Law and um, Dr. Um, Dr. Ledoux and others are looking at, at, at working on some things. We're looking at ways that we can move things around to, to, to lessen that impact, but we will be uh, deficit spending again for FY25. This is uh, just to show you what ha how, how we got to where we're at from a, a pre-mediation to post-mediation. So on February 22nd for FY24, we were estimating the amended budget at a 1.3 uh, million sur surplus. Uh, we ended up selling for some one-time money and ongoing salary and benefit changes. Um, we've made some net budget adjustments so far and we're going to be making some more hopefully. Um, but uh, what's in this budget right now is a $2.4 million uh, uh, budget deficit for FY24. For FY25, uh, at uh, pre-mediation, pre we were showing uh, but a deficit of about $2 million uh, projected. And uh, so we ended up uh, settling at about $2,000 one time in ongoing salaries and benefits. Um, since our, we're going to be spending our, our um, fund balance down, uh, we are, are over fiscal 24 and 25. Uh, we're going to have less cash on hand, so we're assuming lower investment earnings. Uh, so that's how we get a, a projection at this point in time of 6.3. So the projection, of course, is not what you're going to adopt uh, at the end of May for, uh, because we'll, we'll, the, what will be adopted then is it's net of any adjustments that we make between now and then for FY25. This is the, the whole spreadsheet. Again, the same numbers. Uh, but it's uh, just just important to note that as we are looking at uh, um, going out, we have about five years uh, five year projection. Actually, this thing projects out farther than that, but we only show five years at a time. Um, but so we'll have some work to do if if things don't change. Uh, we assume eleven thousand three hundred seventy two uh, students going forward, uh, K twelve, and um, this year we're at eleven thousand two hundred forty two in the blue column. So for FY24, uh, these revenue numbers have not changed on a per pupil basis. Each uh, K6 student brings in, they count as one adjusted pupil unit, and they bring in $10,352. Uh, and then a, a, every 712 student counts as 1.2 adjusted pupil units. Uh, so maybe because they're just more of a handful as they get to be teenagers, right? Um, but uh, uh, we are at $12,423 uh, that each, um, each uh, student brings in uh, for that. So a couple of, of just basic slides on, on how we get our revenue. The general education revenue, which is commonly called the formula or the basic formula, uh, about $87.8 million. It's uh, the largest number of uh, biggest dollar amount that we receive per pupil. Uh, we Categorical aids. Uh, which includes special education, uh, in, uh, account for about $28.5 million. Um, operating referendum, uh, we get a little over $2,000 for that, $28 million there. Local optional revenue at $724 per pupil is about $9 million. Uh, federal categorical programs are just under $3 million. And then miscellaneous includes, uh, a biggest chunk of that is actually interest earnings, but that's also fees and donations and things of that nature. 
So the, as a percentage basis, general education revenue is, is 54%. So when you hear the legislature saying, oh, we gave you 4% uh, on the formula, on the basic education formula, they gave us 4% on 54% of our revenue, not on 100% of our revenue. And our operating referendum revenue does go up with inflation. The local optional revenue does not, federal revenue does not, and categorical revenue does not, although special ed does have its own inflation factor. But there's a lot of those funding formulas on the, uh, um, that I mentioned on a few pages back that basically have been fixed since 2014 with no inflation. And we all know what inflation's been doing in particular the last, the last few years. Uh, but it, even since then, it's, it's even, even more significant. So on a salary and benefits aspect of things, our district is, uh, actually every school district in their general operating fund is still a people intensive business. Um, it takes a lot of staff to, to teach and, and take care of students while they're in our buildings. Uh, but uh, salaries and benefits are $144 million. Uh, purchase services includes uh, everything uh, from uh, uh, contractor services, um, we have uh, utilities in there. Actually, um, we have we actually have electrical service in there, and then supplies actually has natural gas in it. I don't know why the difference, but that's how we have to account for it. And then transportation at 7.1 million, and then we also uh, a transfer to the uh, uh, art center fund of us 647 thousand. But that is actually when we actually accumulate everything for the actual audited uh, budget at the end of the year. Everything gets rolled into what's called the general fund. That's why I refer to our general operating fund as this subset of accounts. Um, on a percentage basis, salaries and benefits are 88%. And the interesting thing about that for our district is because of what we've been able to do on a, from our, our revenue basis, uh, we've pushed all that money into the classrooms. We've held other support areas flat, uh, and we've been able to, we expanded 45% uh, over the years in students, but we actually hired 68% more teachers. Uh, and a similar amount, about 65, 67% of, uh, of additional paraprofessionals over as opposed to 45%. That was good for kids. We had the funds to do it, and we uh, were, were able to then provide additional things. The issue with 88%, or not the issue, but the important point about that is most school districts are typically around 80% in uh, plus or minus 80% salaries and benefits. Uh, so we've been unique in that area that, that way. Our, on a dollar standpoint, breaking things down, teacher salaries and benefits are $108 million for this year. Uh, paraprofessionals, which are our second biggest bargaining unit, uh, and uh, they, so teachers and paraprofessionals are the, the people who deal the most directly with children on a day-to-day -day basis, about $15 million. Um, all other salaries and benefits, uh, uh, administrators, um, uh, payroll, buildings and grounds, curriculum, um, uh, clerical staff, uh, are in the other salaries and benefits about 22 million, and then you see the other dollar amounts there, the same. On a percentage basis, two out of every three dollars that we get in revenue goes to teacher salaries and benefits. Uh, paraprofessionals are another eight percent, so about 74 percent of every dollar we get is spent on the people who deal directly with students. This is a status of our op general operating fund unassigned fund balance uh, since fiscal year 2007, and we gradually built it up over time. Uh, it peaked in fiscal 20, and of course, fiscal 21 and 22 were COVID years, and we got the least amount of COVID assistance uh, in the state with the exception of, of Byron School District, who got about three or $4 less per pupil than we did, but we got $470 per pupil in assistance while the state average was $2,265. And, uh, but we were able to actually utilize our fund balance that we had built up, and we were one of the few districts in the state, if not the only one, that basically had every one of our elementary students in school every day at one to 15 ratios, spread out around the high school and at the elementary schools. And our middle schoolers get, were basically in class, you know, four days, four days a week. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the, the, what, uh, one of our things is our operating uh, uh, fund unassigned fund balance is a cornerstone of our AAA bond rating. We, First earned it in April 2010 as we were on our upward traje trajectory. Um, with, the, uh, with what we have in the budget right now, absent any other further adjustments, so I said before adjustments, this particular projection shows that over the next two fiscal years, which shows fiscal uh, 24 projected and fiscal 25, that we're basically going to be taking that down by about 38%. So 
We still have water under the keel in terms of the fund balance. The fund balance policy is 6%, uh, but we can't continue to, to, to have it diminish at that rate, so we'll have to make some further decisions absent a major infusion of revenue um, going forward. So uh, we'll have some, some tougher decisions to make. You know, it's baseball season, and you expect your financial person to be calling balls and strikes, I hope, and, and just have to, have to call balls and strikes on these. So uh, major fund categories, again, just a different way to look at things, 54% general ed revenue at 7,138 per adjusted pupil unit. You can see how special education is uh, about 19, almost $20 million of our revenue. And then uh, our miscellaneous revenue of 4% and federal revenue. Voter approved referendum at 17%. Uh, we are at uh, $2,110.97 per adjusted pupil unit. Interestingly enough, um, if the voter approved level is actually at $2,330, but there's a, the state cap that was put on actually limits us to actually levying what the voters actually approved back in 2015. So it's, um, uh, but the, st the, you know, the state cap is the cap. So um, the uh, local optional revenue has been fixed at $724. If that had been adjusted for inflation, like our operating referendum, it would be at 900 and about $920 per pupil, and another $196 per pupil would be another $2.5 million. So we've been working hard to try to get, get that passed. Um, several of us have testified at the legislature on behalf of a couple of bills that have been sponsored, both in the House and the Senate. With a little luck, maybe we'll <coughs> excuse me get, get that through uh, for next year, um, although I know the legislature is already saying that they're uh, structurally unbalanced for the next biennium, so we shall see. But uh, the other thing that's important to note is on the last um, comparative data that's available, which is FY22, FY23 actually will be coming out shortly. Um, but out of 331 school districts, in terms of state aid per pupil, uh, we rank 307th. If, you, if one is the top, the district gets the most state aid per pupil. We're at 307th. But the operating referendum, our lo that are, are, since we're at the cap, I mean, thankfully, our, our local voters have supported us. But our operating referendum basically just gets us into basically, you know, right around the median. So there's a lot of uh, conventional wisdom, which is always wrong, but uh, my colleagues, uh, um, other colleagues have mentioned uh, how they hear that people think Minnetonka has a lot of money. The reality is, is we do more with basically average dollars per pupil. So that's a testament to our, our our staff, our principals, the whole district in terms of the commitment to the students because we're getting the excellent results that we get with average revenue. So, and that's, you know, that's just another, another ball or another strike. So um, from, uh, excuse me, our expenditure side of thing, you can see about 88% salaries and benefits, uh, purchase services at, at 5%. You can see in there utilities, maintenance repairs, uh, not, not the long-term maintenance repairs. But those are the day-to-day -day things that we have to do to keep things going. Um, property liability insurance, professional services of, of various types. Instructional supplies, uh, $2.5 million. Textbooks, um, we spend about $780,000 out of the textbook fund. And uh, there's another million dollars actually spent out of the capital projects fund. Uh, maintenance supplies, believe it or not, $176,000. That's basically for... All the uh, cleaning supplies, paper supplies, all stuff for the, for the district, which is actually kind of a, a it's enough, but it's just, it always strikes me that that's a small number compared to the size of the district and the number of students. Transportation, we had our first year of our, 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 our four-year contract with first student. They were the low proposer at 19.9% .9 increase. So next year's increase is 8%, and then it goes down to 5 and 5. Um, so in summary, FY24, it's our 18th consecutive year without a budget reduction process. We have lots of work to do for FY25 in the following years. Uh, for for uh, FY25 and beyond, as of now, state aid and local le levy are our main funding formulas, both controlled by formulas set by the legislature. And uh, they are both controlled by the legislature. And, and state aid is set by the legislature every every year. Again, we also get the least amount of state aid per pupil in the 57 of the 57 seven county metro area school districts, which um, is important from the standpoint of uh, the, uh, the, the metro area typically has overall costs that are anywhere from 10 to between 10 and 20% higher 
uh, than, than cost of operations out state. And, we're in, uh, and we continue to be in the bottom decile for state aid out of all the 331 total school districts. And that was not just last year, this year. That's been year after year after year. So again, a big thanks and a tip of the hat to our voters for supporting us by getting our operating referendum up to the cap. Because without that, we would really just only be able to afford being average. The thing is, is um, without additional operating referendum revenue that we've been trying hard to get, uh, not even having the chance to ask, now we're part of the Peloton. We were out in front, now we're part of the Peloton going forward. And what I mean by that is, Everybody in the group is going through all the budget cuts, kind of the pre-96 graph, uh, graph pattern that they've been continuing on, and we've been able to, to get a, stay above for 18 years. We're, we're now into the, the, the Peloton. So the next, next several years, unless there's significant revenue coming in, out of the, if we get some movement on operating referendum, uh, if we get some movement on some local optional revenue, uh, but, but that's, that right now is, is a, you know, a wish, and a wish is not a strategy. Uh, the reality is, is those are increases are right now are zero. They're not locked in. They're not even on the horizon. We have not been successful. We have not gotten help. So we're going to have to deal with the dollar amounts that we have. Thankfully, we have our operating referendum continuing on, and we have open enrollment continuing on, and we're going to have to figure out how to continue to provide excellence um, while we go through all these changes. That's our that's our job. That that's we're in this business to. Pr by the best we can for students with the dollars we have, and, and so we have to keep doing that. But we are part of the Peloton now, so our, our next four or five years are probably going to look, our, our pattern is gonna, on that graph is gonna look like it did back in, the, probably in the 90s. Uh, so again, a long tectonic shift, but uh, it's, that's where we're at. So we need to continue to deliver excellence. Um, our general operating fund revenue averages the next five years 170 million. And the average of that five years is about 180 million. So we are uh, about $9.2 million structurally out of, uh, out of balance uh, going forward. So we're going to have to uh, do about a 5.4% average reduction over that time. That, ironically, that's about 5% was about what they had to, to reduce back in 2006, which was the last time we had to go through major budget reduction process. So we will be talking about um, we're working on FY25 now. We, we got two and a half months to get things, um, to kind of lower, lower the hit there. Um, but we're going to have to start talking about FY26, which sounds like a long time away, but it actually starts July 1st of 25, and to be ready for it, we're probably going to have to, having done this before, and other districts typically with large reductions coming up, you, you, get your open, you get your enrollment for the year, make your next projection of enrollment in October, and then you start talking about how you're going to be working on modifying the budget for the next fiscal year. So really about six months from now is when we're really gonna have to start addressing that part of it. Uh, our other funds, I'm not gonna go through them in detail, but, uh, but the thing is, is if you look, that's the, in, the other oddball thing about school businesses, we have funds with dedicated money, and they're almost like their own little entity over, you know, from a financial standpoint operating by themselves. And if you look at our nutrition services fund, our community ed fund, um, all of our, uh, our construction funds, our our, uh, um, even our self-insurance fund, we get more revenue coming in because we're getting uh, higher, higher, uh, higher revenue uh, premiums next year. But I mean, those are all basically stable and have significant uh, fund balances and are operating fine. And you see that in, in the information that's been provided in the report. So really, um, and that's not that unusual for other districts also. It's always a general operating fund, which is the focus of most of our money. And it's also where we have the most, um, you know, the, the variability and, and in some respects almost the least control over the revenue. So um, that's where we're at. I'd be glad to answer any questions if you have. Thank you, Mr. Bourgeois. Uh, before we do any questions or discussion, um, could I have a motion to approve amended budgets for fiscal year 2024 as follows? Be it resolved that the School Board of Minnetonka Independent School District 276 does hereby approve amendments to the fiscal year 2024 budget for all funds as presented in the district fund projections for fiscal year 2024 as of April 11th, 2024, including general operating fund revenues of 162 billion, 162 million four hundred and seven thousand six hundred eighty six dollars and general operating fund expenditures of one hundred sixty four million seven hundred and seventy eight thousand seven hundred and seventy four dollars so moved Patrick is there a second second Dan 
Um, any questions or discussion for Mr. Bourgeois? I know we had a lot of conversation and questions about this at the study session, but are there others that have come up? <laughs> Patrick? Uh, first comment. No, no, that's it's it's a valid a valid uh, question and, and a, a good one. Uh, the the I've talked with Baird about it uh, because knowing that we're going to be um, going into um, into the fund balance for the next two years, it looks like with of some, with some of some significant amount. Um, what right now our our AAA bond rating is AAA stable, and uh, if what with the most likely path, that doesn't mean it's the only path though, but the most likely path, Barrett said, is, is if, if as we report in and we're looking at deficit spending, uh, they could adjust it to AAA with a negative outlook. And uh, so you're still AAA rated, but that means that you're kind of on watch. And then if you don't basically get to a balance point, uh, then you'd be downgraded to AA1. Now, that is, I, 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 um, it's kind of like going from, I know, well, for the non, for vegetarians, I'm sorry, but this is the best analogy I can think. Of. It's kind of like going from Kobe beef down to, you know, prime rib. I mean, it's really, it, it, AA A one is a very good rating out of 23. AAA A is, um, is the highest you can get. Only three districts in the state have it, and only about 90 out of over 13,000 in the country have it. So it's, we've been in very rare air in the, that regard. Um, the difference between the uh, interest rates are probably 10 to 15 basis points on, on a coupon if you're, if you're selling bonds. Uh, so instead of if you had uh, coupons at 3%, you'd have them at 3.10.1 or 3.15. The, the point at which they would do, also do that in terms of the fund balance is it, it, they, also, they look at the trend, but we also, we've been AAA rated and, and we've actually been AAA rated even though we have uh, had our general operating fund balance has actually been about about 75 percent of the average of um, of AAA rated districts um, in terms of our percentage basis. So we've been actually low, but they still rated us AAA because uh, they've they've you know and, and you got to you have to sell every time. And you don't get it every time just by showing up. It's like the Super Bowl. You got to win the trophy every year. So you got to sell them. And we've had a really good story. Uh, you know, we had excellence in, in, in our student uh, population. The other thing that's been a really strong feather in our cap is our population pays their taxes. We have virtually zero delinquencies. So we pretty much have 100% of tax collections by the end of the year. And uh, so that, you know, there's, and we also aren't reliant on one single employer. Like we don't have, oh, the paper mill might shut down. So, um, so we have those things going for us. And so there's not a set dollar amount like, oh, you got down to 6%. I think if we were dwindling down closer and closer to 6%, we probably will get downgraded uh, to AA1 somewhere before that. That's my best estimate. Any other questions or discussion? Okay, we have a motion and we have a second. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We have an amended budget. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Bourgeois. Um, next item on the agenda tonight is review and approval of policy number 534, Equal Educational Opportunity. Superintendent Law. Madam Chair, members of the board, this is a repeat on this policy. This was brought forward because of a change in statute, and there was some clarification we were seeking to align our language to the statute. We had to do a little bit more research, so it's back for a second time and final approval. Ms. Flowers. Thank you, Superintendent Law. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. For policy 534, equal education opportunity, as Superintendent Law said, these changes are due to legislative updates. The first change I'd like to point your attention to is under the general statement policy, the language that's being stricken. 
That is the former definition of sexual orientation. That is no longer the definition in the Minnesota Human Rights Act statute, which is where the changes are coming from. However, if you look under the general statement policy, you will see sex included in there, and under federal law, sexual orientation is covered under sex. In addition, there, the word identity was added after gender in the statute, Minnesota Human Rights Act, so we made that change as well to reflect it and ensure that our policy was compliant with both federal and state law. And with that, I am asking for you to approve this policy as presented. Thank you, Ms. Flowers. Uh, can I have a motion to approve policy number 534, Equal Educational Opportunity, as outlined in the board packet? So, so moved. moved. Dan, is there a second? Second. Sally. Uh, we have a motion and a second. Any questions or discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is approval of the long-term facilities maintenance 10-year plan annual update. Superintendent Law. Madam Chair, members of the board, at a recent work session, Mr. Bourgeois ran through our long-term facilities maintenance plan. We are a district that is eligible for long-term facility maintenance, and in order to receive those funds, statutes require the district to review that plan and roll it forward every year for the next 10 years so that you're constantly looking 10 years out with this plan. Tonight, Mr. Bourgeois will share the summary of the plan and really what we are approving is projects for the summer of 2025 because we've already bid and started essentially projects for this summer. Mr. Bourgeois. Thank you, Superintendent Law, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, just a quick synopsis of where we've been at for long-term facilities maintenance. This is one of those other funds that it's kind of self-contained. We issue bonds and we do projects and it all fits in one nice package and it's nicely balanced on an annual basis. So um, this is just goes to, to a, a slide that I like to show, which shows a decade of, of when our buildings have been built. And uh, so it's always nice for the public to see this. Uh, we have a lot of square footage that is actually, I use the term eligible for Medicare, but um, uh, also even our, even our newest facilities other than the Badge Momentum Building have had at least 25 years of use or more, almost all of them. So uh, in the green bars, those are the, the facilities that we either bought or constructed in terms of building additions and then also including the Badge Momentum Building since 2007 when we started our, our enrollment growth. But the, the issue about the blue ones is that, and actually even the ones that are, are, are some of the things that we've been building, or we built in 2007, 2008, there's some things coming up for, for maintenance on them. So it's just like your house, you have to replace a roof, or you have to replace windows and you know, the furnace or the air conditioner, hopefully before it goes out, like what I did. Um, and, um, and so there's big, big ticket items that you need to do. And so you have to put money into our buildings. But our buildings have good bones. And uh, we've been steadily rebuilding them. Um, I just kind of coined the term rebuilding for 2075 because a lot of the things we're doing aren't going to be touched again for 30, 40, 50 years. So um, we're hopefully paying forward what the investment in the community was. Uh, this actually is just a slide of all the bond issues that we built to uh, build those the, the building additions and, and facility improvements uh, it, from 2007 or 2008 through 2024 that were in the green bar on those charts. So, and we, and we did that without uh, doing a bond referendum. We, didn't, we made about $4 million worth of, of, uh, of, of revenue in operating capital and, and lease levy uh, uh, pay for about $100 million of improvements. There was a lot of Saturdays and Sundays kind of trying to figure out things and move things around to restructure uh, and create payment capacity so we could stretch out our, uh, our, our uh, ability to do additions and, and capacity so we could continue to keep growing up to the 11,200 where we're at now. Uh, we've also done a lot of long-term maintenance uh, in the last you know, 15, 16 years, about $118 million steadily putting money every year into the buildings. There was a lot of, a lot of deferred maintenance uh, back in 2006, 2007 when we, as we had just gotten into this program. And so actually a lot of the money in those first couple of years were spent actually at the high school. Uh, just some really quick what, going through and, and just pointing out uh, just for a quick Clear Springs Elementary School, uh, the red part was built in 1958. That's the original building with all the additions around it. Deep Haven, the light blue, was built in 1956 and additions around it. 
Excelsior Elementary School, the uh, light blue on the far uh, upper right was built in 1929. And then uh, a 1958 uh, edition actually was separated for a few years and ran as a separate school until 1964 when they connected it. Uh, Groveland Elementary School. This is not the original Groveland Elementary School. Uh, the original was back in the 1850s, the first school, public school in, in the state of Minnesota. Uh, it was actually built on this site right about in the area where the orange is on this, on this diagram. Uh, but the, red, the, the biggest part of this building that's there now was built in, in uh, 1958 um, also in red. Minnewashta Elementary School, there's a small chunk of a 1938 building and then in, in beige and then uh, purple or lavender is the 1955 uh, building that was uh, constructed during the baby boom years. Scenic Heights Elementary School, until we built Vantage Momentum, was the newest original construction building that we had and that's the light blue in 1967. So we had, have gone 57 years between building that new building and then building um, the Banage Momentum building. But we've also gone um, almost 30 years without a building bond referendum uh, election. Uh, over at, at Minnetonka Middle School East, the original building was built in, in 1964 and it was in, highlighted in green with various additions. Interestingly, between 2008 and 2024, the, uh, the middle schools are the two schools that have the, had the least amount of additional space added. We added 6,377 square feet for five classrooms in 2012 at both middle schools. But anything else we've done for accommodation at this building to accommodate the gro student growth has actually been internal modifications. So as we look at uh, task force, facility task force, we need to take a close look at them. Uh, same thing with uh, the... Um, uh, MME is uh, the 2012 edition, identical size, and uh, 1964 in green. Big chunk there that, you know, 64 was 60 years ago. And then the high school, uh, it doesn't look like it was, it doesn't look like it's 72 years old, but uh, the lavender part was the original building, and that was built in 1952. So, but we put a lot of money into it to keep it up, and um, there's been tuck pointing done over the years, and window replacements, and doors, and Rotundas and added, and, and um, so uh, it's, it's going to be good to go for a long time. And the Community Education Center had the original building uh, built in, in pink there in 1938. So we have a, a really good, good fleet of buildings. They got good bones, as the uh, TV show says. And uh, so, again, we've been rebuilding them uh, for the last, you know, 17, 18 years. We've gotten current on all these different building systems there, major building systems that you see. Um, Unit ventilator systems, which is actually, uh, they're up to date, but we're also converting them also to HVAC as we replace them. So we'll, we'll have full HVAC by the end of September of 2025, or by, by September 2025. And in 2007, we had the high school was AC and the media centers at the two middle schools were AC and everything else was like little room uh, air conditioners hanging out the windows like little mushrooms or barnacles on the side of the buildings. Um, so we're almost to 100, we're getting really close to 100%. Um, we've done mechanic, all our pool mechanical systems are up to date in door safety hardware, which was related to uh, safety initiatives to be able to lock doors from the inside um, instead of having to go out in the hallway. And uh, we've uh, done uh, restroom overhauls. Uh, we've overhauled every restroom except there's one set at the high school that was put in in 1998, and we're going to be doing that in the next couple of years. So just kind of a before and after, this is the way the whole Minnetonka High School looked uh, in 2007. Everything was white brick, and um, you almost expected to see Nurse Ratchet coming around the corner. Um, kind of very institutional. Um, but so some of the improvements that we did is resurfacing the hallways and making, uh, making things uh, look a, uh, just a little bit more up to date. The other thing that was interesting about that is there used to be a lot of... A lot of uh, uh, tennis shoe and sneaker marks on the walls and, and Sharpie markers on the walls and a lot of trash on the floors. And as we started going around, it took five years to update the hallways. And, but as we started going around, the trash got less and the marks got less. And um, so now, um, and the students really respect the building now, which is really, really great to see. So we've been building uh, over 20 years, really. Um, we're working on it. And, and it's kind of almost parallels the 47 to 67 post-war building boom. The important part about this slide is um, we have about almost 1,870,000 square feet and 260 acres of land. Uh, 
it's, it's cost effective over the long term because uh, new construction is basically $479 per square foot, not counting cost of demolishing a building and then building on the same site. But that's about $4.07 per, seven per square foot over the next 10 years on average, 1 18th. If we just keep steadily putting dollars into the buildings, we should be able to keep them uh, effective and, and looking in, in a state of good repair and good condition. We want our buildings to look not ostentatious but stately because they should look important because what goes on in the buildings is important. Um, it's a prudent course of action. Uh, the cost to build new at $479 per square foot for our buildings is almost $900 million. So we're responsible for some very expensive, very important, uh, really, uh, community infrastructure. This is just a chart showing uh, how things will, will look out over the next uh, several years if uh, you approve the 10-year plan update. We do see a, a lower level coming along as we uh, kind of get a, a chunk of things replaced. Uh, it's not adjusted for inflation, but it's estimated, there's an estimate of a little bit of inflation in there, um, but who knows where that will go. So our last couple of slides, uh, we're basically, uh, some of the major projects, we're doing about 1.3 million of exterior siding replacement at Clear Springs and uh, replacing some windows. We're doing window replacements at Deep Haven, uh, roofing, Roofing is real expensive since the polar vortex it never has gone, come down. Roofing and paving at Excelsior, uh, we have to replace some small air conditioning units. Uh, Groveland, we've got air conditioning units and window replacement and some cabinets. We're almost done getting around replacing the 60-year-old cabinets. We only have a few sections left at a couple of elementary schools. Minnewashta, we got uh, uh, cabinet replacement and unit ventilators in 21 rooms, which is, turns them into HVAC. We have a little section of wall tile replacement. Scenic Heights, oops, sorry, Scenic Heights, we are uh, replacing some rooftop units and also uh, doing cabinet replacement in 14 rooms from the original 1967 cabinets. And then at MME, uh, we've got unit ventilators going into 20 rooms and the same at MMW. At the high school, uh, we're basically doing some gym rooftop things, uh, re HVAC replacement and uh, a big chunk of roofing replacement there also and at community education, some HVAC. So uh, that is, is the, uh, uh, the plan that we will actually, we have to submit the 10-year plan to the, to the Department of Education, but then they approve just the first year of the plan for funding. So, and this is our format, so every year we have to have you approve the 10-year plan, you know, March or April, and then the Department of Ed comes out with a, a, a specific form, and they always come out right at the end of June, so I, I have to race to get it done and then we have to always have a, bo a board meeting at the end of June so that we can get it in and then get approved so we can issue bonds uh, for the next project. So we'll, we'll have a, an, another state form of this 10-year plan for your approval in June. Uh, but with that, I'd be glad to answer any questions and thank you for considering approval of the 10-year plan. Thank you, Mr. Bourgeois. Can I have a motion to approve the long-term facilities maintenance plan for fiscal year 2026 through fiscal year 2035, including projects estimated at a total cost of $76,010,000. So moved. Chris, is there a second? Second. Kemery, um, any questions or discussion? Again, we saw this at the study session as well, so I think we got a lot of our questions answered. I hope the community is happy to hear also that the air conditioning is almost complete. I've heard, you know, with our warmer springs and warmer falls, that'll be a relief for the students to have and the teachers to have a climate-controlled room when it gets warm outside. So thank you for all your work on this. Uh, we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, thank Mr. Bourgeois. Can I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Dan, is there a second? Second. Mike, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Um, next up are any board reports. Do any board members have reports to share? Dan? We had a, a finance meeting toward the end of March. I think you just, the, the board just saw most of the results of that meeting, but we spent our time talking about a lot of the issues that we heard about tonight, just with the upcoming uh, budget tightening that might be necessary, what that's going to look like. But um, outside of that general operating fund, all of our other funds look like they're in really good shape. Thank you, any other board reports? 
All right, superintendent's report, Superintendent Law. I'm gonna restate what we heard just a little bit about. We are kicking off our facility study on Monday, uh, April 15th from six to eight. 30 community members volunteered to serve on that committee. 26 were selected. They will be meeting every second or third Monday, uh, actually moving around the district and meeting in building sites so they can see uh, firsthand those buildings and then get recommendations. We're also doing a, a staff survey, a community survey, and then we'll probably likely follow up again with surveys at, towards the end of that process. Lots of chance for the community to give input. Uh, that leadership group will be steering some of that survey process and the board should be getting updates, but that kickoff starts Monday night. Thank you. Any announcements? Chris? Yeah, I'd like to um, uh, announce the Tonka Pride Spring Sale. Uh, it's coming up Friday, April 19th, and Saturday, April 20th. It's uh, right here. Um, this room transforms into uh, all things Tonka uh, uh, o o uh, in the course of a couple of hours. A um, couple of things. They are ha having um, some extended hours, so it's 12 to 7 p.m. on Friday and 8 to 3 p.m. on Saturday. And all merchandise is 25% uh, off. So come get your Tonka gear uh, for, for all the spring and summer sports. Um, just to reiterate, if people don't know what Tonka Pride is, um, it's a uh, it's a committee or a group that, and all the proceeds benefit um, our schools uh, E through eight, so preschool all the way up to the middle schools. So all the funds are distributed. Thank you. Any other announcements? Can I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Dan, is there a second? Second. Kemery, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We are adjourned.